Salam and peace. Uh, this is Imam Malik Mujahid, and you're watching Muslim Network TV on Galaxy 19 Satellite, Amazon Fire TV, Raku TV, Apple TV. Uh, 57 subscribers of our satellite and about 100 million of the other channels. I hope you're watching any of those places. Uh, we are available on OTT devices like uh, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV. Uh, Raku as well. Um, you can download our app on iPhone or Android uh, or watch on YouTube. Just type Muslim Network TV and you'll find us. Uh, our website, of course, is muslimnetwork.tv. Um, we have just amazing show today. Uh, in an Islamic, Islamophobic environment uh, where 90% of news about Muslims is negative, a hijab often becomes a subject of Islamophobia instead of a faith practice. And now French government with all the muscles and all the mirages and atomic bombs is coming after, quote unquote, protecting Muslim women, unquote, from being forced by male relatives for wearing hijab. So governments are involved in trying to save Muslim women. What else do we need? I remember being in with, with some uh, extraordinary sisters at the Democratic National Convention. And a lot of people were surprised and they were talking to Muslim women with hijab as though they have just landed from Mars. Well, I forgot whether men are from Mars or women are from Mars. I forgot all of that story. So a whole lot of people, unfortunately, uh, do not see it as a, a faith-based practice, uh, despite Mary, peace be upon her, coming out in such an honorable way with a beautiful um, uh, whole uh, set of uh, uh, observance, uh, which resembles uh, just like my mom, who was named after Mary also. They think Muslim women are being forced. Uh, so a Muslim organization, ISPU, actually not a fully Muslim organization, it's a research organization. Majority of the people there are Muslims. Uh, they surveyed, they ask a question, are you forced to wear his up? And guess what? Answer case came back, yes. A whole 1% of all women surveyed say they are wearing hijab because of pressure. I repeat, whole 1% of all people who ask, they say they do that because of pressure. So there is some truth to that, all the Islamophobic stories about that. And I don't know how they ask the question and things like that. But Muslim women are fighting back. Tahira Rahman, I remember her, she used to work for Muslim, uh, uh, for Radio Islam, run by the same organization. Radio Islam is now rolled into Muslim Network TV. We were there for 20 years, live every day. And uh, uh, she is now a reporter in Austin, Texas. She will apply and apply and apply. I don't know how many times, 50, 60 times, and will be rejected. And some people who are kind, ask her to take off that hijab. But I absolutely remember a pioneer, two pioneers, Sharifa Al-Khatib and Amina As-Silmi. When I chair um, Bosnia task force to and started fighting against uh, uh, rape of Muslim women in Bosnia, 50,000 of them were raped. Sharifa Al-Khatib called me that National Organization of Women who we have coalition with, uh, they are saying uh, they will not allow any woman with that thing on the head. And she said, what do I do? I say, invite them for a dialogue. He said, what's the benefit of it? I said, benefit will be that you will not question how they wear their clothing 
and they will not question how you practice your faith. And that was the conclusion. And then we happily work together, National Organization of Women. So Muslim women are fighting and taking a stand. Today we'll be talking with several Muslim women who have been taking a stand for their faith. But one of them is a very young person. Uh, she is a volleyball player. I didn't know people play volleyball in America. I used to see uh, people playing that when I was a kid and I played it myself. And uh, that's Naja Aqil. She was not allowed to play a match because she wears a job. Uh, welcome to Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. So we have with us Naja uh, Aqil and Ali Aqil, her mother. And she fought back. Today, thanks to her taking a stand, U.S. high school volleyball players are okay to wear hijab thanks to this 14-year-old uh, player who played hijab along with volleyball. So thank you so much for joining us. And we also have uh, a person uh, who is an award-winning journalist and editor of uh, Oat Hijab, Dilshad Ali. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Did I pronounce oat properly? I tried the French, French pronunciation and the British and the American. I couldn't figure out which is right. People say it many different ways. I think hot hijab. Okay. You say hot hijab. You could say hot hijab. <laughs> hot hijab also. Okay. I didn't know many that. Many different ways. <laughs> okay. All right. So, you know, French are giving us a trouble. Now they are fighting a hijab while we have difficulty pronouncing how to say hot hijab. All right. And with us is a colleague who served on the board of Sound Vision Foundation, who was a staff of Radio Islam and the leading the board of the Radio Islam and civil rights law expert, adjunct professor, Janan Hashim. Assalamu alaikum, Janan. Alaikum salam. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for joining us. Uh, tell Naja Aqil, um, were you more sad or were more upset when they deny you to play with the uh, hijab? Um, I think I was both. I was really angry and sad, but I wasn't like sad because like it hurt my feelings. I was just sad because nobody knew about the rule. Nobody knew what was going on. So it made me upset. Hmm. And how did you celebrate when they were when they agreed with the, that's OK? <laughs> Some family friends took us out to dinner. All right. OK, so uh, Alia, a secret question, which we are not uh, tell Naja about. Did she cry? <laughs> um, she cried. Yes, definitely. You mean she cried when it first happened and she's cried, you know, once the rule came out and it was changed. She was so excited about it. So, yeah. Yeah. She shed tears, which is tears of happiness. Yeah, that, that happened. I'm one of those people. I was preparing for this show. I mean, Janan, I know some words, so I didn't research her, but I was researching Dilshad Ali. And uh, I didn't know who she is. And I ended up on one of her video. Oh, boy. <laughs> I ended up crying. <laughs> I'm crying again. I'm almost afraid to ask which one. <laughs> well, you were talking about your son. Yeah, I figured. Um, but this story is extraordinary. And, and uh, when, you know, it just kind of, we were working at Hot Hijab on a, a campaign called Camp Ban Us about supporting um, uh, Muslim women athletes who have historically gone through this uh, problem of, of having to have waivers or being disqualified or banned or told, you know, you need to get special permission just to play. I mean, which is really rather ridiculous when you think about it. I mean, you're just playing. It's just, what does it matter if you're wearing a hijab or a turban or whatever on your head? And, and the jazz story broke right as we were working on this campaign and it all, it, it just, it was really something to be part of it. And, you know, 
I look at you guys and, and you're when you're 14 and you know, I have kids also, I have a 13 year old, I have a 17 year old daughter and you know, the poise with which the Akil family has handled this. I know when I first interviewed them, they talked about how they wanted to change things, not just at a school district level, but on a state level. And here we are in February and we have national changes happening, mashallah. So you mentioned uh, um, uh, Dilshad national changes happening. So in area of volleyball, but are there other sports this yeah, year? Muslim absolutely. Women? So Najah and, and, and Sister Alia, they started the ball rolling. And, um, you know, we did some presentations at our company with uh, the Volleyball Rules Committee with the National Federation of High Schools. And um, just kind of explaining what hijab is, you know, even now it, it's, it feels silly to say this because you think people would know. But even now there's just so many things that are uncertain or unknown by someone, you know, by people in athletics or in, in school systems about, okay, well, what, how do you wear the hijab and what material is it made out of and what about the pins and is it really dangerous? And so we did this whole presentation about, you know, different ways it's style, different materials you use. What are sports hijabs like? You don't have to always wear a pin, you know, straight pins versus hijab pins versus magnets. I mean, we did every, we explained it all. And and um, Lindsay Atkinson, who was the um, director of sports and the liaison to the the rules committee for volleyball was like, you know, well, this is pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty easy. And alhamdulillah, you know, they changed their rules and it, uh, field hockey and soccer has followed suit. And, you know, this is this is the work of Alia and Naja and then the women before them and the women who are working alongside them, mashallah, the young girls and women. Naja, uh, so, I mean, in a school, what type of questions people have asked you before this happened about uh, hijab? Um, they haven't really asked me anything because I don't know. They are used to me wearing it. I wore it. My mom didn't make me wear it until I got to puberty, but I would wear it, wear it on and off throughout elementary school. So they saw me with it and really only my teachers asked me why you wear it and I told them because of my religion and to cover up and to be modest. And um, that was really it. I haven't had any problems other than the incident that took place in September. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, now that uh, this whole episode has happened, are you getting more respect from your class fellows? <laughs> um, well, we're not in school physically so we don't really talk but yes my teammates and some of the girls that i have talked to through social media yes yeah so sister alia what was the most difficult thing uh, when you came to know about uh, what happened to naja i think um the most challenging thing for us was dealing with the state level you know, that was the most challenging part. The national level, it was a breeze. You know, we met with them. They asked us a few questions. And like um, Dilshad said, we put them in contact with Hall to Jab and it went smooth from there. So our biggest challenge was the state level. Um, and I think the publicity, the national publicity is what really helped our fight on the state level. And, you know, like Najah, her school just stepped in, Valor took over. They were like, we're going to take care of this and it's going to go well. And they did it. So it wasn't that hard for us. So you, this was your state, Tennessee, right? Yes. Okay. So Janan, Tennessee is, I mean, you're a lawyer, civil rights lawyer, and uh, Tennessee is one of those states which uh, sign into law, anti-Sharia law. Do you, do you think some of these states have more prejudice and uh, confusion when it comes to how Muslims practice their faith? Yeah, undoubtedly. Uh, a lot has to do with the pressures that are placed on the legislators that kind of trickles down through the news and other means to just the people who are on the ground. And uh, uh, the people on the ground hear what their representatives are saying. And if that's misplaced, 
uh, if it's incorrect, then they are promoting incorrect statements. So that's why it's important to engage in these conversations and to educate and to inform. And what Najah did um, right from the beginning at her school, because she's like, you know, people really didn't ask me a lot of questions, means that that was a school that was supportive and understood who she was as an individual. And then when she she faced some difficulties, they were willing to step up to the plate and act on her behalf and tell the administrator, administrators at the state level, you've got it wrong. And they were willing to engage in conversation. And when you engage in conversation, you know, if people are willing to listen, and it seems like that was the case here, certainly at the national level, it took a little bit of effort, it seems, at the state level, but eventually they understood. And that's what it's about, because once you have that dialogue, uh, uh, then people understand, and when they understand, they realize that they misunderstood, and then they end up becoming an advocate for what they now have learned and can you know, push things forward accordingly. So, you know, we're, we're undoing the harm that was done because of Islamophobia and the anti-Sharia laws that were really pushed through over the last 10 years or so. Well, thank you so much. So dialogue opens door and all of you are saying that when we uh, open conversation, move forward and people are willing to accept. I mean, this, is, this has been my experience as well. Uh, we take one step and I see our neighbors taking many steps towards us, but it does take somebody to speak up or take a stand. And that's where what uh, Naja Akil did uh, with the support from her parents, uh, I think uh, made a difference. I mean, the whole thing, don't you see, Ilshad, uh, uh, sorry, Dilshad will not go forward unless somebody is willing to take a stand. Well, that's definitely the case. And and the, the one of the things I find very fascinating about what happened in this situation is that, like you said, Sister Alia, it happened so quickly. You know, there was pushback at a state level, but it went remarkably smooth when it got to a national level. You know, um, our meeting, uh, the company's meeting with, um, with Lindsay Atkinson, you know, the volleyball rules committee was just pleasant and, and, and wonderful. And we just sat back and, you know, let's, let's see what happens. And next thing we know, that's a unanimous vote to change the rules. And then right after that, we're told that it's not just volleyball, it's two other sports. And it looks like winter sports and spring sports, you know, that are the rules committees uh, that deal with the NFHS that looks like, I mean, I'm not, it's nothing's a uh, guarantee, but it looks like it's going to happen there too. And my question was, you know, why now? Where did this momentum come from now? I mean, I remember just last year, you know, we all knew the story of Noor um, Alexandria Abukaram in Ohio faced this on cross country, you know, being disqualified from her race because she didn't have a waiver for her hijab. And then before that, you know, you brought up the story of Bilqis Abdul Qadir, you know, and she couldn't uh, play in international, um, in the International Federation of Basketball, in the International Basketball League because of FIBA rules. And and it was like a three-year battle for that rule to change, you know? I mean, it was on an international level. So there's a whole other, you know, set of complexities there. But it took a while. And and and, and Noor uh, last year, you know, faced a lot of pushback. I think geographically where you are, like you said, Imam, like your school environment and how supportive they are. The, you know, the, as times and things progress, all of that factors into it. Like the momentum now with you, Naja, and, and Sister Alia, and this story, I found it to be pretty amazing, actually. You're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with four people who enhance religious freedom in America, Naja Akil and Alia Akil. Dilshad Ali and Janan Hashim, and we'll be right back after these messages. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Adam. You remember me? I appeared in so many episodes Sound Vision has put on the market, no matter what it oh, no. Hey, what's happening? Hey, oh, sorry. Lockdown is what it is. Well, continuing here, in this lockdown, 
sound vision never stops thinking about you, the viewer. Well, to get back into production again, online and in line, everybody in their own space, e even me. Although I'm stuck with Lenisa. Salam! <laughs> Salam! Salam! <laughs> I, know, I know, you were shocked too. Well, l let me continue. Uh, this, is, um, this is what I was going to say. Salam! 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 Cut! 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 <sighs> Finally, I get my own screen time again. Thank God. And so we invested in new equipment to bring you even better production with new songs and new singers and animations. Well, here are a few clips. And Sound Vision has brought all this into your home, making Islamic values and teachings easy. And if you know me, Adam, a multi-talented actor, <laughs> well, sometimes I'm an actor and, and the reporter and the... Oh, that's enough. Let's move on to the next section. Well, you can watch these new episodes on our new app at www.adamsworldapp.com. We have previews happening every day on Muslim Network TV. Sound Vision has been serving generations, moving and changing with the times. We are all faithfully connected. That is a huge blessing. Your donation helps keep these programs available now and into the future. We take this job of helping tomorrow's Muslims today seriously, and you should too. Today, we need your help. Children absorb and learn from everything they encounter. Make that wholesome, positive, grounded in our faith, Together, we can accomplish our goal of raising better Muslims, better neighbors, and better citizens. Please donate generously. It's an investment in our future. But to finish, let me tell you there are new scripts on my new mission. And it is something that I enjoy talking about. My new mission is Hey! Houston, we do not have a problem! <laughs> Salam! See you soon!
Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is uh, Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with Naja Aqil and Alia. And with us is a journalist, Dilshad Ali, and a civil rights attorney, Janan Hashim. Uh, Janan, as a lawyer, do you encounter personally this type of uh, discrimination? Well, yeah, this discrimination, it does happen. Um, in my practice, more so in the uh, employer context. Um, but in the school system, the, the interesting thing is, uh, before I became an attorney, I was a, um, a high school uh, teacher uh, at an Islamic school here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I enjoyed running when I was a kid. And uh, I, I did indoor track, spring track, and uh, cross country. And so I wanted to start a track team and a cross country team at this Islamic school. And we got permission and we ran in track meets and cross country meets and we had girls who were running and they all wore the hijab. And I remember when we went to the meets, um, uh, if there was ever a question, it was always from, from the officials, like this is for religious reasons, right? And we're like, yeah, and that was the end of it. And so I was kind of surprised to see that I think what we have here in these um, more unusual circumstances is that a referee knows the rules really, really well and is simply doing his job by applying the rules. And uh, in not knowing that uh, permission needs to be obtained from the state association and not having that waiver to the rule, uh, we had a situation as we did with um, with Naja. But I, I think what happened, the, what ultimately happened is get rid of this rule because it's really unnecessary if the focus is on safety, make the rule about safety. And I think that's what happened. And it was an appropriate reaction. Hmm. Uh, Dilshad Ali, you're a journalist. I've been for a while. Uh, did you face any um, uh, discrimination because of your hijab? Um, personally speaking, I think, I think we all could tell a story here and there, most of us living in this country. Um, I, I didn't start wearing my hijab till I was an adult. I was well in my 20s. I already had two kids um, when I started wearing my hijab. And I would say after that, I would classically um, airport stories, which a lot of us can report. I think I'm the one who's always pulled aside when our family travels internationally. I've been, you know, taken aside. I've been taken away from my kids and put in a room. Like I remember once coming from Canada to the U.S. and and I was, it was myself and my children and I was escorting and my in-laws were with me and my mother. So I was in charge of all of it. And I was pulled aside for about an hour, you know, and nothing said to the family about what's happening. I mean, it's just extra questioning and extra, you know, security. We just accept it and move on. But you know, those are the kind of things we all deal with. Um, I, I was in New York when 9-11 happened, like really, really, um, close. I was in Midtown Manhattan and that was when my journalism career was starting. So 9-11 was the first big story I covered in New York. And I was not in hijab back then. I would I began wearing it, I would say about two years after, two, three years after. And uh, yeah, you know, there are different things that you face. You know, people will yell stuff at you. And I definitely had some discrimination happen to me um, as a youth, even just hijab no hijab just being muslim being a woman being brown brown or black you know we all went through stuff like that um hijab is just another layer of it you know so mm. well i i was in a neighborhood uh predominantly muslim not predominantly a good number of muslim in that neighborhood when 9-11 uh, happened and uh, well suddenly everybody coming into our office who used to wear hijab uh, was without it I mean, it, uh, I heard that someone gave even a fatwa that for your security, uh, you know, you can make uh, those type of decisions. Do you think, uh, um, you know, this question is to all of you, uh, whatever you can think of a point of pressure regarding hijab uh, 10 years ago, are people more relaxed uh, and have better understanding uh, besides the case which uh, Naja Akhil faced? I'll chime in. I'll say that there's progress, but there's also some confusion. Uh, and, and I think the confusion is in large part because of what you had mentioned earlier, Imam, about the Islamophobia and pushing a certain agenda and perspective that is an incorrect 
narrative. Um, so we're having to, to double time it and to correct the, the miscommunications, to correct that, that wrong narrative and to reinsert the correct narrative, which is our narrative. Uh, but then on the other hand, you have people who see the anti-Sharia laws and this Islamophobia as nonsense, and they're able on their own to figure out right from wrong, and especially, I think, with those who, who have Muslim neighbors and who are willing to uh, be neighborly toward them and to embrace them as friends. And then they can say, well, no, I have a Muslim neighbor. And you know, the mom wears the hijab and I talk to her and what this guy is saying is totally wrong. And it's because they got it from our perspective, from our mouth. So I think that's a big contributor to uh, to undermining the agenda of those who want to uh, paint the hijab as an oppressive symbol. We have the opportunity as Muslims with those who know us to collectively say, you know, this is about courage to be able to stand out like, like, you know, uh, Najat as a young 14 year old to stand out in a crowd completely different from her peers, that takes strength, that takes courage, that is not oppression. That is a courageous young lady who has an incredible future in front of her. And then to be able to react under a strenuous situation with dignity and poise and to channel her frustration and anger into a civilized conversation that garners respect. And now all those people who she's encountered with have the um, that firsthand experience to say to other people who, who've got it wrong, say, man, you've got it wrong. Muslims are not about this. The hijab is not about this. So that's how I, I would say it. It's a two step forward, one step back kind of situation. Hmm. So Dilshad, do you think America is moving forward when it comes to understanding the faith practices and allowing full freedom of religion to Muslims as well? That is a very heavy question and you could write books on that question. Um, <laughs> okay. I will say that I why, have why not, why not write a book on that question? Yeah, I, I think books have been written on that question. And mention me in brief preface. Yeah. Um, I would say that I, I have been covering Muslim communities in America for two decades now. Um, like I said, I started with I started with 9-11, you know, 20 years ago almost. And um, and here I am now uh, focusing on Muslim women. And I think um, what uh, Sister Janan is saying about a two steps forward, one step back is a pretty accurate, simplified description of it, you know, for the purposes of our interview, right? And um, I really felt after 9-11, two decades ago, and you know, Najah wasn't even born yet. My, two of my kids weren't even born yet. They're all post 9-11 babies who don't even remember, who weren't even part of life pre 9-11, right? So you can't, that's a whole other topic right there. And um, there was, I feel in like the five years after that, there was a lot of acceptance. Maybe it was just talk. Maybe it was just superficial, superficial and not deep, but at least there was talk, you know, there was, you know, not not all Muslims are like this. You know, it was coming from our administration, all that stuff. And then I felt it's got it went in a in another direction. You know, it went further back. A lot of polarization. I mean, we all saw what happened in the Trump administration. You know, a lot of divisiveness, a lot of polarization, a lot of you know um, mistrust, and again, like the perpetuation of stereotypes and the worst types of, you know, images regarding Muslim or Muslim women, all those things tended to kind of make a comeback. Um, and I almost feel like we were in a better place back then where we are now. But what also has changed and what also has been really heartening and really powerful to see to what um, Sister Alia and Najah and, and Sister Janan um, has mentioned is um, there's a lot of ownership of who we are now. There's a lot of pride and a lot of, more of us are comfortable especially our youth, you know, and, and Naja, you can speak to that. I mean, I have kids as well. Like I look at my daughter and, and, and she, she goes around in high school, like just being who she is, you know, she's not, I wouldn't call her publicly Muslim, but she doesn't hide any of it, you know? Whereas when I came through the public school system and I'm born and raised here, I came through the public school system and I, um, you know, I fasted, I prayed, I did all, I did it all. And, but I did it really quietly in the counselor's office, without letting anyone know what I was doing. <laughs> I didn't want to be open about it. 
Um, and it's not the case, I feel. Uh, I feel it's more about, you know, owning your story, being proud of your narrative, um, uh, you know, not shying away from that. So those there's two things happening here. And some of it is hard, you know, to report on and to watch as a citizen and to report on as a journalist. And some of it is really um, beautiful and, and um, inspiring to report on. You're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and we're talking with Naja and Ali Aqil, Dilshad Ali, and Janan Hashim about hijab and the challenges of religious freedom in America. We'll be right back after these messages. My wife, who uh, she's a professor at the University of Cincinnati, who, who's Catholic, and by her watching and listening to our three-year-old son uh, watch Adam's World, she ended up taking Kalima Shahada. She embraced Islam because she learned so much about Islam and the other prophets. It really affected our life in a great way, and because of uh, Sound Vision and Adam's World, we're Muslims. I took my Shahada 15 years ago, and I actually am from a rural part of Ohio. And so I found the catalog for Sound Vision, and I ordered the the tapes and the CDs and the books, and I used those, and especially for my little daughter, you know, that's how we basically learned our Islam, and Islam entered our hearts through the wonderful works of, of Sound Vision. Okay, Assalamu alaikum, brother. I just want you to know that I love the Sound Vision website, that a lot of times when I'm looking for information, especially as it relates to homelessness, domestic violence, and women issues, I go to that website, and then I see what you've written, and then I copy and paste it, and spread the word, because the wisdom is there, so I can't you know, I can't do any better than what Sound Vision has already done. Sound Vision is our survival uh, uh, guide. It is the uh, organization that provides skills for Muslims how to survive and thrive in this uh, community here in the U.S. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Anam. I'm in 11th grade and I grew up with Adam's World and what it taught me was unity, respect and love for the Muslim Ummah. Is Adam's World is the greatest show ever made. Take me to the Kaaba, man. I love that puppet. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and we are talking with uh, Naja and Ali Aqil, Dilshad Ali, and Janan Hashim. Um, one question I have for all of you uh, is going to be about the question each one of you receive uh, from people who may not be hostile uh, about uh, what is this on your head. 
uh, I mean, I, I hear a lot of interesting stuff and I like uh, people to know about it. Uh, so anyone of you have any story, you know, but they, they, there are some innocent uh, things so which bring smile to you, to your face when you hear that. I'll, I'll chime in. I, I'm just laughing because uh, I remember when I first started wearing hijab, uh, it was, um, I chose to wear it just after graduating from undergrad. And uh, interestingly, um, like two days after I decided to wear it, I got an invitation for an interview with my first, the first place that I applied for work. And it was at a hospital. So it was all new to me. And uh, I was in the hospital setting and once it took about three months before my colleagues became comfortable uh, and saw me, I think, for who I am, not just for the outside that there's, they, they got beyond the hijab and they got to see my personality and understand who I am. So there would be like a time like on the elevator between floor six and nine and a doctor would come on. So, you know, I see you wear that on your head. Can you tell me why you wear it? I'm like in three stories between, you know, four, the, the, between the sixth and the ninth floor, really? <laughs> and so I, I ended up having a very short version of it. And I just said, yes, it's very simple. So guys won't go hubba hubba. <laughs> and, that, you know, and then the doors would open on the elevator. And it's like, okay, I get it. Uh, but then actually, Brother brother Maddox, uh, it was when I was sharing that with Sister Amina Asilni, Alayahamha, very oh. dear friend of mine as, as she uh, was to you, she actually corrected me. And she's like, you know, it does not say anywhere in the Quran that it is for modesty purposes. I'm like, really? She's like, yeah, if you, it's interpreted that is for modesty purposes, but that's interpretation. And if Allah wanted it to say specifically, so guys won't go hubba hubba or, you know, something along those lines, he would have said it. But what he did say, because there are two verses about wearing the hijab, what he did say is for a Muslim woman to cover themselves so they can be identified as such. So it's more of a marker of saying, hey, we are Muslim women and to be seen as that and to be given the respect that we deserve uh, and everything else that comes from seeing a Muslim woman, um, you know, as, as she is. So I thought that was really a, a very interesting perspective, and I, I embraced that um, that that perspective. And so now I'm just trying to find a short way of saying that. So <laughs> <laughs> between what floor levels? Yeah, really. <laughs> so anyone else has any interesting questions that they got? Sure. For me, it was more or less from my family members, my mother's side of the family. They were used to me not wearing a hijab so when i start wearing the hijab my grandmother was the first person to say aliyah why you put that on your head why, aren't you hot in that and i was like no ma'am and so i just began to explain to her you know why i choose to wear hijab and um after that now my family everyone knows you know aliyah and her family they all wear hijab. So for me, it was at home. <clears throat> it started at home for me, not so much out in the public. Um, I've learned that people tend to be more nervous to ask, you know, what's that on your head? Because by the time they get to know me, that's not even a question. They don't care. But for people who don't know me, I think they're more hesitant to ask. That was my situation. You know what I said to one person who said to me, this man said to me, a total stranger, aren't you hot? Uh, aren't you hot wearing that? And I said, well, my husband thinks so. <laughs> <laughs> and that guy, he was, he was a big white guy and he got so embarrassed. He didn't know what to say. He just kept walking on. <laughs> oh my goodness. I think you're so, wonderful to be around. <laughs> I'm just watching Naja cringe in the background over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but just like Naja, have you, like you know, as a, as a teen, you were saying that no one ever asked you anything because you know you wore it on and off, and kids don't really care. Like, have you ever been asked by any of your classmates? You said teachers. Like, do they ask like funny questions, or are they kind of are they respectfully asking? I'm just curious. Yeah, it was re very respectful. I remember in my fourth grade teachers, I wore it one day 
And they were like, I like your, it was printed. It had prints on it. It was um, like a floral print. They said, I like your scarf. I was like, oh, thank you. They were like, what do you wear it for? And I was like, for religious reasons. They were like, oh, okay, are you going to like continue to wear it? I was like, maybe, I don't know, maybe when I get older. So most of the time it was very respectful. And if children in my school would ask, I would just tell them, for religious reasons, because at the young age, I didn't really know what to tell them. And that was the only time that they would ask me was in the elementary school. And I love hearing that because I really feel like that kind of is the marker of how you know, you know, things are slowly moving in a direction where you want it to go, where the questions are more respectful or, you know, sometimes people don't know, like they ask you and, and there's microaggressions in there or there's awkwardness. And I certainly have gotten questions like that, you know, private setting. And, um, you know, we all have to make that decision for some of us, you know, we're like, I'm just not going to deal with that anymore. I'm not going to answer those kind of questions anymore. I don't want to talk about this anymore. And that's, you know, that's totally your right to do that. Um, for me, um, I... I, I don't mind most of the times, you know, I have a couple friends who start by saying, listen, I, I, I want to ask some questions. They're going to sound really stupid. Are you okay with that? And, and I, I love that they start that way. And I'm like, yeah, sure. You know I mean? You, you're openly acknowledging that you really don't know how to do this, but you're still curious. And I'd rather you come to me and we'll mm -hmm. talk it out than just, you know, harbor questions in your head and what, and not being able to ever discuss them, you know? A lot of the talk these days, especially, you know, whether you're Muslim or you're or you're or you're a person of color or you're black or you're black Muslim or whatever is, you know, you don't want to have to explain yourself anymore. You're, you're you know, people should educate themselves instead of expecting you to do the education. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's, it's still both. You know, yeah. we should educate ourselves. We should seek knowledge out ourselves. But you know, we're also kind of lazy and we need to be helped. <laughs> we're going to ask questions, you know? So. And, in, and in society, you know, today, the reality is a lot of people don't educate themselves when yep. it comes to other religions. You know, I have an aunt and she's Christian. She practically raised me. And one day we were just on the phone having conversation, religious conversation. And she said something about Jesus. And I was like, oh, girl, Muslims love Jesus, too. And she was like, what? You I said, absolutely. So then I had to go into the history of it. And she was just blown away. She said, I had no idea. So you just have to educate people. I have no problem. Ask me the questions. Let's get the answers. And if I don't know, I'll contact somebody who can tell you. That's right. how I look at it. What about the little bit uh, conversation about a Muslim debate about hijab? I have seen Muslim, uh, uh, you know, mostly sisters in a strong conversation about wearing and not wearing. At one time, it was quite a bit. Uh, is there is still that discussion go, go, going on or people do whatever they want to do? I think that question will go on till the day of judgment. That's what I think. <laughs> Yeah. The question is always there. In 20 years of covering these our communities and, and sometimes, you know, privately telling my husband, like, if I have to write another hijab story, I want to do something. <laughs> but here I am working on hot hijab, you know, so you know that those stories will always be there. And, you know, that there are women, mashallah, who are strong in their faith and their practices as a Muslim and they, they don't wear hijab. And that's that's what that's their decision that's their internal thought process that's what happens so that those debates will always happen and they flare sometimes you know you get you get an op-ed in the washington post or something i remember about five years ago and then um it becomes big news and then it cut, dies down but it'll always be there mm. yeah definitely and you know i've learned in my years that i know muslim women that don't wear hijab. And they're some of the most loving, kind really? Muslims, you know? And then I know Muslim women who wear hijabs that, you know, sometimes I have to make dua for. So, Absolutely. you know, it's for me, I, I don't judge. I just, I love her people by their character. And that's what I focus on. Whether you have it on or not, that's not my, you know, I can't judge you for anything. 
So I think once women or people in general just start looking at it in that perspective and not looking at it from a negative angle, then the world will be a little better. MashaAllah. Uh, that's beautiful, Sister Aliyah. Uh, you know, at one time, I ended up writing an article in defense of those sisters who don't observe uh, hijab because I felt uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in our community culture, uh, it was difficult. It was becoming difficult for them to move and be part of the community. So I, I, I especially respect what Sister Alia phrasing herself uh, that she prays for some of those people who even have. So thank you so much. But tell me, each one of you, including myself, have daughters. I never ever spoke to any of my daughters about hijab. Uh, have you, uh, as mothers, spoken to uh, your children about hijab and how that conversation goes? Because, you know, ISPU survey on one side refutes, but on the other side, it says that 1% of the people who responded to them uh, did say that uh, they, uh, they, they're they observing hijab because of pressure. I, can I speak first? Please. Um, for me, I have two daughters. Um, Samia is 11 and, of course, Najah is 14. And this is, our, this is how our conversation went. I wear hijab. In our household, this is what we do. Once you become an adult and you're no longer in our household, you have to make the decision on your own. I'm not going to push you into doing anything, but this is a decision that you will make outside of our house, not inside of our house. And I explained to her when she had to start wearing hijab. And for Najah, I mean, if you don't, if you know anything about Najah, she is just like, all right, this is what I have to do. Let's go. You know, and at first she just wanted to wear it in a bun in the back. And then it evolved and she evolved. And now, you know, the only time she wears it in the bun is during volleyball. Other than that, she's full, fully covered. And she, she tells me, she's like, uh-uh, mama, you need to fix that. No, put on another one. It doesn't match. <laughs> That's our conversation. And I just try to keep it honest, real, and upfront with them. That's that's how I handled it. Yeah, I, I think that's the, the right approach um, is the pressure, pressuring a daughter into wearing it, you know, when she goes off on her own, she's going to take it off. You know, it has to be Allah, for the sake of Allah. Mm -hmm. And if she chooses not to, to wear it in that moment, it doesn't mean that she won't be wearing it in, in the future. Um, and I think that a parent's um, perspective on letting it be her decision every, you know, is, is the, the better way to go because everybody has a different spiritual path. And we don't want to put barriers on that path. We want to remove barriers. And one of the best ways to do that is to allow that spiritual path to grow naturally. Uh, it's not inappropriate to tell them what your, your perspective is on hijab for yourself, or as my husband say, if I were a woman, I would wear it, but I, I can't force any other woman to wear it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's a healthier approach than saying, well, so long as you're in my household, you're going to be wearing this because they're going to be like, okay, fine. I can't wait to leave. And what's the benefit is that, you know, and, and you're, we're not serving uh, a lost purpose, I think, mm -hmm. in, in taking that perspective. Especially if, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, there's no compulsion in religion. <laughs> His words, not mine. <laughs> so Dilshad, what are your thoughts about that? Um, I'm trying to think of what I can say without divulging private conversations with my kid, you know, what, what's respectful to her. Um, I think, you know, we all have to approach it the way we approach it as moms. And for, and for me, um, having just made the decision completely on my own to uh, wear hijab, um, you know, when I was well in my 20s, it was never, ever, ever a thought for me when I was a kid or um, growing up, a teenager, college, you know, we were, we grew up in the Midwest in the 80s and 90s and, and then came to the East Coast. And for my parents, like, it was all about, like, 
Let's make sure you know how to do salah. And that you do it five times a day. Let's make sure you fast. You know, let's make sure of the fard of, you know, you fast, you pray, you know, we're going to teach you what zakat is. We're going to teach you, you know, good moral behavior. You're not going to date, all those different things, right? And um, and they ain't never really talked to me. I mean, I had modesty dress um, guidelines and restrictions upon me. I, you know, you're not going to wear shorts, you're, all that stuff. But it was never about, I think, possibly my parents thought when I was growing up that if they took me to that level of a uh, hijab, you know, when we were growing up in a, in a very white community, that it, it might have been too much. And, and my, my mom didn't wear it either. And so it was a free decision that I made in my adulthood. And so now that I have kids, um, you, you do what your parents taught you, right? So my 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 approach with my kids has always been let's make sure you learn salah. Let's make sure you do it five times a day, which we still struggle with, I have to say. Let's make sure you fast. Let's make sure that you know the importance of that and why we do it. Let's let me teach you about zakat. Let me tell you about hajj, you know. Let me talk to you about different moral things that are important in our family. Let me impose various aspects of modest dress. And they see me in what I do. And my daughter and I have certainly conversed about it several times, but I sometimes tell her, I said, I think I'm the only mom. I feel like sometimes the only mom who, when you've come to me and express interest that I'm like, hold up, are you sure? Are you thinking about it for the right reasons? I know you, I know you like your hair. <laughs> like, are you gonna stick with it? Because I'd rather once you come to this decision, like Sister Jan says, you know, for the sake of Allah, because you believe it is good for your faith and your iman and you know your personhood that you stick with it instead of like i'm gonna try it then i'm gonna take it off like i don't know that would that would hurt me more even though it's really not about my feelings so those that's how we've approached it uh, so, do you feel uh, that uh, people are taking out uh, their hijab and scarves because of public pressure? Have you observed that? I mean, yeah, that, that's a whole other conversation. We could probably do another show about that. But yeah, it happens. You know, I mean, you go through stages in life. As uh, Sister Janan says, you're, we are all on a spiritual safe path of some sort, and 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 we go through different stages of it, and and things change in our life, and. Sometimes we start wearing at a certain age and then we feel like we don't want to anymore. And and I have personal thoughts on that that I don't want to share right now. I mean, I, I, I am feeling like I'm representative as a journalist, but like it's it's tough. It is really tough. And it's and it's very tough in this fishbowl world of social media that we live in where everyone's ready to come at you, you know, whether you do something or you don't do something. So it's just it's hard, you know, and and. May Allah make it easy on everyone, whatever it is that we're doing, you know, or trying to do. Sister Alia, what is your observation? Are Muslim women taking off their hijab because of pressure? Well, not in my community. Um, typically, the women, the Muslim women that I am around, just about all of us wear hijab. We all have our complaints, you know, when it's hot or whatever the case may be, but we never take it, you know, we haven't considered taking it off. That's just not something that we've done, but that's just in the community that we're a part of. Um, I don't know of anyone that wants to take it off or not wear it. I, I yeah, that's not okay. Well, so let's let's ask uh, Naja. So, what are your goal in volleyball? How far you plan to go in playing volleyball? Um, I want to go to college. I want a scholarship for volleyball so I can go to college with the scholarship, and I want to play it throughout college. But I don't think I'm gonna do it as like a professional sport. Okay. You, you should try out for the Olympic Olympic team and become the next Ibtihaj Muhammad, but with volleyball. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> okay. okay, Janan, didn't you get that question that do you take it off when you take shower? I have. It was earlier on when I was a hospital social worker, and I just kind of like, no. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, do I take it off when I take showers? Like, but yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, that was kind of a confounding question. But I, you know, this is the thing. We have the opportunity to either turn a person away 
from asking questions or to make make them feel welcomed. And so as much as I was chuckling inside, I, I, I kept a straight face and I, I answered it with as much dignity as I, I could. And to give the, the person who was asking me, you know, the dignity that she deserved, because it takes courage, I guess, to ask these questions. And I mean, my, my, um, my, my niece uh, asked my daughters when she was like five years old, my daughter was wearing a red hijab. I was like, you know, why do you paint your hair red? You know, it's cute little questions, you know, but that's how she's seeing it. So it's kind of cute. Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Naja, you are simply <laughs> great. Uh, and thank you for Mother uh, Alia. Thank you so much for being supportive and standing by. And Dilshad, thank you so much on working on opening doors for other people. And uh, Janan, thank you so much. I uh, truly appreciate. Uh, we have uh, journalists, civil rights attorney, people who are taking a stand and fighting to enhance religious freedom. When we fight for our freedom, we ensure that everyone else will benefit from religious freedom. And that's a pillar of our society. But remember, freedom, just like Iman, didn't stay at one level. You have to work on it. You work on it, it increases. You forget about working on it, it's down. Thank you so much for watching and thank you, all of you who have been here with us on Muslim Network TV on coming, watching through Galaxy 19 satellite, which covers the whole United States, Canada and Mexico with 57 million subscribers, mostly in rural areas where you may not have a neighbor who is a Muslim. So we are your neighbor through Muslim Network TV. And we're always there on 24-7 on OTT devices like Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Raku. And you can always download our app on Android or iPhone or watch on Muslim uh, on, on YouTube. Just type Muslim Network TV, and which is our website also, muslimnetwork.tv. So thank you so much, all. Peace and salam. And thank you, for Dil Khan, for producing a beautiful show. Thank Dr. Abdul Wahid for assisting. Peace. Thank you for having us. So nice.